Uh, I was in the early stages of a book tour. My talk now will be about that book. Um, we can call it book tour interrupted because uh, from I had to spend you know all of March to the the March to June speaking tour sort of canceling all of these uh, flights and so they all came in one day after another in that March period. Um, the fall is still uncertain, but um, anyway, that's where where I'm at now, and I'm keen to uh, explore um, this way of communicating with people. So. Um, uh, again, I'll, I'll get started now, and I presume the next step is for me to share my screen so that I can get my uh, slides up there. All right, um, I'll get started, and uh, the book is called The Citizen's Guide to Climate Success. It came out in February of this year. Uh, it's with Cambridge University Press. It's something that reflects uh, my thinking of the last two decades. Uh, I am, as Jeremy uh, noted, a uh, an economist. I actually build energy economy models that governments use, including the government of Saskatchewan at various times, to assess the effect of their policies um, that to reduce greenhouse gases, because a lot of policies are actually not very effective, which I'll be explaining in this talk. Um, and, um, and I also was sort of tired of being a researcher who would produce the same thing over and over again. Uh, and you'll see that when I give my policy prescriptions, this is what you've got to do. Any government has to do this. We've known this for decades. There is no growth in human knowledge on the policy front. And, um, and, and therefore, I became much more focused on the political failures, our inability in our societies and in our governance to ad address this, this, uh, this challenge. And what could I do as an academic to reach out to non-experts with simplifying the problem? And that, that's the goal of this book. So um, I'm gonna get on it uh, right now. You'll also notice I've deliberately not mentioned COVID. And it's not because I'm trying to pretend it's not there. It's because, um, well, I'm going to have a different take on, um, on how important it is in terms of our major goal of reducing dramatically global greenhouse gas emissions. But I'd be happy to pursue issues like that, questions like that, uh, in our question period afterwards. But for now, I want to get out the main thesis of the book. So um, here goes. So the goal of my book is to help climate concerned citizens detect deliberate delusions and inadvertent myths to elect climate sincere politicians who do effective policies and to eliminate their personal emissions with just two actions. And a key theme is about you know, human cognition and the need for inward focused critical thinking. And to, uh, to make that point, I'm, I'm gonna start with, uh, with a couple of quotes. Uh, and so the first one, if it's working, oh, here we go, is uh, by Upton Sinclair, who was a, uh, a writer in, about 100 years ago. It is difficult to get someone to understand something when their salary depends on them not understanding it. Now, th this is where um, I have to get used to this kind of, uh, I actually get a lot of laughter uh, from an audience when I put this one up, sort of knowing smiles, Maybe I'd get that, especially in Saskatchewan. Um, uh, but um, I'll just have to assume, since I, I, I did give about eight talks on the book, that I know hopefully what your reaction is. The second um, quote is similar, but slightly different. And it's by the, about, again, about 100 years ago from the philosopher Bertrand Russell, who said, what someone believes on grossly insufficient evidence is an index into their desires. So you see, on the one hand, I'm talking about, with Upton Sinclair, what you might call self-interest bias. You know, is my income coming from this, and therefore I want to be selective about what I think? And I may do it unconsciously, probably. And another one is, how do I want to see the world? And, um, and so that can lead to, in, in the case of with Bertrand Russell, um, sort of what we, we sometimes psychologists refer to as wishful thinking bias. So... Already you can see with me starting out like this, I'm kind of in, really interested in learning from psychologists, social psychologists, uh, behavioral economists, about how people really uh, learn about the world and how they, they distort from uh, evidence sometimes. 
And one way to bring this out, and I do that early in the book, <laughs> is to talk about something that I do in my own teaching for uh, almost three decades now. I've taught a graduate course in uh, sustainable energy. It's interdisciplinary. And I get these very bright graduate students from the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University. And we hold some of the classes uh, uh, in my dining room, which I suppose you can see behind me right now. Uh, I put in extra tables and construct things. And um, we played the, in the very first class. I make them play <clears throat> what I call the debate yourself game. I ask them for their opinion on something that's related to uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It could be, but it's gonna be something that, where I kind of know what their position will be, like nuclear power or biofuels or um, large hydropower. Like these students, uh, some of them are from economics and engineering, some of them from other disciplines. And um, this is an, an environmental resource program. And what you'll find is a lot of them are uh, you know, quite in favor of renewable energy and energy efficiency and not much else. So I say to them, okay, um, what's your position on nuclear power? Give it the best argument for whatever your position is. And uh, invariably they're opposed to nuclear power. Then I'll say to them, now give me your best argument. Give me what is the best argument, lay it out for why we should do nuclear power. So that's just an example, but it could be any topic as I say. And what happens is they do a terrible job. Like these are, you know, very smart students and they just can't think of the best arguments that run counter to the position they've taken. So I make them do it again and I make them do it again. And, you know, eventually some of them get a little better at this, but it's quite striking how even, you know, in the tradition of academia and, and critical thinking, um, how challenging it is when we've decided we believe a certain thing to actually critically look at the counter information and look at it in like its very best light. Like, and I'm proud of the fact that in my research group, we've always done that. Our motto has been, if especially if the leading scholars are saying something that has not been something that we've agreed with, we have to know those arguments intimately. And it may drive us to new areas of research. And that's why um, a, a, a quote on that, you know, sometimes it means that after you've done that, you won't change your mind. Sometimes you're, uh, you're less rigid in your thinking about something. And sometimes you may even change your mind, which uh, makes me think of a quote right here from John Maynard Keynes, uh, when the evidence I see changes, I change my mind. What do you do? Now, let's apply, try to apply this thinking to the challenges of decarbonization. And, you know, what is the, the general challenge? We know what it is. We have to stop burning fossil fuels, uh, whether it's coal to make electricity or gasoline in cars. And when we look at the evidence, though, on this challenge, I would argue that there are three big particular challenges to this problem, to this, this, this mission. Um, the first is a myth that fossil fuels are expensive. So in fact, fossil fuels are plentiful, high quality, and low cost. The Earth's crust full of them. And when we have ongoing innovation or declining demand, their price will fall. So you can't just sort of say, oh, well, renewables will be cheaper than fossil fuels. And I'll be saying, when? Like, under what conditions? With what feedback on the price of fossil fuels? And of course, uh, recent events um, give an indication of that. But I wrote about that 15 years ago in another book about fossil fuels. Um, and fossil fuels, therefore, still offer the cheapest development path for the poorest people on this planet. And that was the path that China has followed. Um, rising from a very poor country in the 1980s to where it is today. I'm not saying it's all wealthy. Uh, there's a great disparity of income in China, but it's phenomenal to see uh, the, the creation of wealth. And then if we look at a graph on, on emissions, and I'm sure you've seen these, this shows uh, 1960s through to 2017 or 18, and you see the emissions uh, of um, gigatons of carbon, CO2 emissions of China uh, in that period of rapid growth surpassing uh, the USA, Europe, uh, and of course staying and shooting way above India, leaving the question of 
what happens in India, what happens in the rest of the developing world. And if we look at the next, um, oh, and so, so I want to focus first on this point about, you know, renewables, um, they're not winning. The, this data right here is from uh, BP statistical review, other uh, reputable sources. And what it's showing is uh, the black columns indicate um, annual increases in fossil fuel use. Uh, and it's measured in um, million tons of oil equivalent, so in energy units. And the green columns uh, show uh, increases in renewables and nuclear, which is almost entirely renewable. So nuclear has been kind of static for a couple of decades uh, easily. And what is important to note is that even while people have had this narrative in, since at least 2000 that renewables are cheaper, we've just kept adding more fossil fuels because for the poorest people on the planet, especially, that's where the fossil fuel growth has been and because it represents the cheapest path to development. And I've even shown here on this uh, graph that, um, you know, people said, well, we've, uh, renewables look like they're increasing there. We had the Paris Climate Agreement in 2015. And even in the three years of data that we have reliable since then, fossil fuels once again outgrowing renewables. So interesting question going forward. And if we look at this, uh, this, this, this um, figure here is both a, a backcast, like looking historically, so it's historical data, and also a forecast from reputable sources. And the point again is that that growth in fossil fuel use because of the attractiveness of that form of energy is really happening in the developing countries. Developed countries, most of them are starting to make some headway. We've got about 18 countries now that in the last few years have seen their emissions go down slightly. Um, so that growth is really forecast in those developing countries. <laughs> so remember, that was the first one, okay? The myth that fossil fuel, that renewables are getting cheaper than fossil fuels. The second key challenge is the myth of a voluntary global agreement. Now, so we know we need, it's a global problem, we need an, a united international effort, but we haven't been able to do that. And uh, why? Well, we've got poor global governance. Um, no country can really act alone because if you do uh, act significantly, it's going to affect um, uh, your industry, it's going to affect the, your cost of production and your competitive position. Um, and, as, uh, and then uh, finally, uh, so instead, we have these meetings once a year and all the countries get together. And this is the uh, conference of the parties, the COP process. It's, it's what did lead to agreements in Kyoto and Paris um, in 1997 and 2015. But those agreements, um, you know, didn't have any kind of a binding nature to them with penalties if you didn't do it or if you pulled out or didn't do what you were saying and when at those meetings though the rich and poor countries I don't, you know I'm, I'm lumping them into two categories which is a, a, a gross simplification but basically the poor countries are saying you're gonna have to give us some money to help us out not go on this cheapest path and you're wealthier you got wealthy in the rich countries by um, uh, by exploiting fossil fuels and using them. So help us out. And every year, the rich countries say, we agree, <laughs> we're gonna give you some money. And then, the, 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 then they negotiate and of course uh, they're, they're miles apart and they always will be miles apart. Um, it, it is, so as long as we're trying to get this voluntary global agreement, um, that's where it's going to sit. And that's why um, uh, you know, the binding agreement has not occurred. And this is how one cartoonist sort of depicted uh, you know what this what this really means, um, and I, I just thought this was a very good cartoon, uh, sort of saying, yeah, sure, probably when the climate impacts are so great, uh, for example, rising seas, uh, that might be the time that you finally reach a binding international agreement. So we're living under this myth of a voluntary global agreement, and um, uh, there's been lots of people, uh, leading academics, have been arguing about why this will keep failing for 25 years now. So again, my whole point from the beginning of this um, uh, talk that the motivation for writing my book was to bring out things that leading experts kind of all agree on. Um, and then the third one is the myth of rational domestic policymaking. Now I'm referring to countries that would 
characterize themselves as democratic, but this, this can apply uh, to other countries as well. But, um, you know, let's say you elect politicians who are climate sincere. And I think it's important to have this distinction between climate sincere and climate insincere, because there's lots of insincere ones, as you'll see. So what their task is so difficult <clears throat> because first, the fossil fuels are incumbent, and so our financial self-interest motivates corporations and individuals to trumpet the benefits from their continued use. We're all familiar with that. The second is if a, cl a climate insincere politician can actually fake it. Um, first of all, we're trying to transition, decarbonize an economy that takes decades. So they can set these distant targets, say to people, vote for me. Oh, but you don't need to have actual policies that would achieve them right now, or I'm doing things that will achieve them. And there's no proof, right? Because it's only a few academics screaming, me writing an article in the Globe and Mail or being on, you know, on CBC or something saying, those policies aren't going to do anything. All experts would agree on that. That's really hard to counter, you know, the, the, the machine of a, of a political group in the midst of, a, of an election, trying to tell people, uh, we can make it with this without doing these things. And then climate insincere politicians in that regard can actually lie about the economic harm from the policies that we know are effective, which I'll talk more about. And then and a great example, and I mean, this is right across the country, but certainly in Saskatchewan, you know, exploiting the anti-tax biases uh, in the case of a carbon tax, whether it's an ad in Ontario about scrap the carbon tax or even demonstrations that in, a, in France, um, that in a, uh, in a typically French way, uh, are very dramatic uh, as well. We, we Canadians don't quite uh, rise to that, that level. So stop there, and I've got those three things, right? Um, the, 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 the fantasticness of fossil fuels, the global nature of the problem, and then our challenges in our regular, you know, our, our political systems are pretty good at dealing with immediate concerns. And I write about that in the book. I even mentioned a pandemic uh, or an economic crisis or a terrorist attack or, a, or a, a, you know, a, a war. Um, but they're not as good at sort of this sustained effort that you need to address something like climate and the big challenge of decarbonization. Now, so with these decarbonization challenges, then the path seems complicated to many people. And I've got a, I, I just looked around, it's so easy um, for this, for recent talks, this isn't even in the book, but I find these all the time. Here's a quote from Lisa Song, who's a reporter writing in ProPublica. She says, fossil fuels are so integrated into our lives that phasing them out would require us to change everything about how and where we live, how we get around, and how we make money. So I don't know about the people on this talk, but when I say this to a live audience and can get that back and forth, I, I see a lot of nodding heads like, oh my goodness, that's so true. Again, this is me talking especially not to experts, but to people who are climate concerned, members of the public, and who want some guidance here. And they're like, oh man, all these things I'm supposed to do, it's so confusing. So my goal in the book, <clears throat> what I do in the book, is I explain why the path is actually very simple. And that's the argument I'm gonna make, and I'm happy to argue with anyone who's saying it's not so simple. So what is that simple path? So I've got a series of things here. The first is that we must focus on key actions in key sectors. And so what do I mean by that? What are key actions? So one, the, the, the key is to wrap, in general, is to rapidly phase out the burning of coal, oil, and most uses of natural gas. Uh, the countries that are starting to tie into coal phase-outs, countries like China and Norway and others that are trying to get rid of, uh, really reduce the use of gasoline. Um, so these are these are the actions. But how do those and and, I, and how do those? What are the sectors? Well, I've already just given you the example. The key sectors are electricity and transportation. And why is that? Well, first, we know a lot about the technologies that we would need to do that. And we have those technologies and we've had them for a while. And of course, they're developing all the time. And of course, innovations can make them cheaper. But we already know um, that we can move around people and goods without burning gasoline. We already know that we can make electricity without burning coal or even um, coal and natural gas. 
Um, and here's the important thing, though. You remember I started by saying it's a global problem. Well, in your domestic sectors, like electricity and transportation, you can decarbonize these and you don't have, because the costs are modest, you don't have a huge negative effect on your economy. But if you're a typical country and Canada is one of these, you have these, what we call emission intensive trade exposed sectors. So these are larger industry like steel, cement, aluminum, chemicals, pulp and paper. And those industries are, of course, competing um, globally. And so, uh-oh, how can we act unilaterally in those? The point I made earlier, if you act unilaterally, you will increase their cost. If you do it in a significant way to decarbonize, you'll increase their cost of production and expose them to competition from the same sectors, uh, industries that are in countries that are not. Um, trying to act as aggressively on decarbonization. So you're constrained. And so that's why I'm separating the economy into the sectors where you can move more quickly um, and, and the ones where it's more difficult. And a, sec a, a final point of that is that uh, luckily, electricity and transportation, just those two sectors alone, account uh, for more than 50% of future greenhouse gas emissions, energy-related greenhouse gas emissions, and most of those happening in developing countries. So basically, we have to act in electricity and transportation and then you know, transfer that as an act that goes global. And I'll talk more about how one would do that. But first, I want to just show you a pie chart of some uh, that, that explains that. These two pies represent uh, industrial countries, so the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD, and the non-OECD, which includes China. Um, uh, and what this shows, the, the size of the pies, shows their energy-related CO2 emissions by the year 2050, if we just kind of stay on the path that we're on right now. In, in other words, we don't ramp it up and really get aggressive policies globally. And what you see there, though, is that, so this is a forecast from standard, um, you know, leading jurisdictions. I think we use the IPCC and something else. And the red represents uh, emissions related to electricity production, whether using natural gas or coal. And the yellow represents emissions related to gasoline and diesel and jet fuel and other, but so basically oil-based liquids in transportation. So look at that. I mean, that is profound. We can act on electricity and transportation domestically, unilaterally, without waiting for a global agreement. And by the way, in doing so, um, and if we can also segue that into actions in the developing world, um, then we're already a good way to, um, to, to addressing this problem and we're buying time for while we work on the more uh, intensive sectors. Um, now, so the first part of that was where should the actions be? And the second part is um, what are the policies that would cause those actions? That is the decarbonization in electricity and transportation. Well, so to have those decarbonization actions, you need government policies. And we call those compulsory policies uh, because you can't escape them. It's not violent. You can't just say, oh, I don't want to be involved. Um, and so I've got this very simple schematic which categorizes climate energy policies into compulsory and non-compulsory. So the non-compulsory is what we've mo what mostly uh, people have done up until the last few years, and in Canada federally up until the year 2015 when the, the, the Trudeau government came in, which was information, labels, subsidies, government do, working on its own buildings or vehicle fleets, you know, subsidies to consumers and industry from government. Um, but that doesn't really compel anyone to do it. So it's all voluntary. And the information can be, you know, a Rick Mercer commercial, which we had a lot of those about uh, 15 years ago as part of our climate policy uh, efforts. The compulsory policies can be simplified into carbon pricing and regulations. And we're going to do both of those. And we are doing both of those. Uh, there are big debates about carbon pricing versus regulation. I don't want to get into that in this talk. Uh, I can address it if people want in, in question period. Um, so that's sort of what we need. And what are some basics about the compulsory policies? So as I said, carbon pricing and or regulations to drive decarbonization. So just think of that. I said and or. In other words, carbon pricing is not essential. 
this is quite uh, humorous because I, I have like, the, if you, if I po uh, pressure any leading scholar, they'll agree. Oh yeah, it's not essential. That's right. We could, if we can measure something to put a price on it, we can measure it to regulate it into non-existence, like to ban it. Um, and what's interesting is sort of conservative politicians in Canada have latched onto my statement and said, you see, Jacker says we don't need to do carbon pricing. Um, but then they've all said, because it's too expensive and so on. And then they, they forget to hear the second part is, well, no, actually carbon pricing is the cheapest way to do it. Um, but you could also do it with regulations. So if you're not going to put on carbon pricing, then you need regulations. And if those regulations are somewhat flexible, which is something that I'm doing a lot of research on right now and doing advice to government, um, they may be, it, it's harder for a climate insincere politician to lie to the public uh, and get them all fired up in the way that they can with a carbon tax. And these are almost as low cost for the economy. But truly, carbon pricing is the cheapest way uh, to reduce emissions. Um, but we do note that regulations uh, in the real world are playing a key role in a lot of the leading jurisdictions. And, uh, and in fact, this slide right here uh, shows that. This is, this is from the California, Air Res uh, one of the main institutions that is implementing its climate policies called the California Air Resources Board. And this pie is, to, is depicting the reductions in California emissions, both what they've experienced so far since about 2008 when they got started to get serious on this and forecast out to 2025. And, what you, and so that, that pie represents the reductions from where the emissions would have been. And, um, and then the, in the yellow are all the different regulations. Um, a renewable portfolio standard, which forces a rising share of uh, renewable elect generated electricity in the system and therefore forces out uh, coal uh, and even natural gas. A low carbon fuel standard, which works in transportation. Um, a vehicle emission standard, which says, okay, you can only sell this kind of vehicle, and so on. Uh, and whereas the cap and trade is one, is one of the two types of carbon pricing. That's what Quebec has today. Um, and the other type is the carbon tax, of course, that British Columbia has and that's now being um, implemented uh, federally. So the point here is simply that when people tell you you have to have carbon pricing, it's not true. It's not true. And if they tell you, but carbon pricing is playing the lead role, that's important. That's also not true. Uh, I can go to Scandinavia, I can go anywhere. It's the regulations that are leading. But then if they tell you carbon pricing is the cheapest way to do it, that is true. Um, so, okay, I'm in the final sort of uh, third of my talk here. The path is simple. So you just, I've just shown you, it's these simple actions, phasing out coal, phasing out oil in a couple of sectors, and you, you have to have pricing or regulations. So it doesn't matter if you've had a COVID or you're recovering from COVID, you have to have those things. And a lot of the other stuff's peripheral. So for three decades, experts have known a coordinated global effort won't happen voluntarily. Electricity and transportation are achievable and globally critical, and renewables won't beat fossil fuels without carbon price or regs. So if experts know this, what's holding back global decarbonization. And this, the big message of my book is that the challenges that hinder us, the, the, the myths that hinder us, um, are on all sides. So I'll work through them. The first one is deliberate delusions. And I've, I don't want to spend time on this. Fossil fuel interests will deliberately promote myths to stall action. They for argue the climate science is uncertain. And if that doesn't work, they'll say, but this next fossil fuel project is essential. Or, you know, we've got to wait for major innovations before we can decarbonize. Remember, I already pointed out to you, we already have all the technologies we need and have had for quite some time to decarbonize uh, electricity and transportation. And, so, and that there's no point acting until there's a binding global agreement. And it's true. It is difficult to act without a, blind, a binding global agreement. But I've just shown you a simple path where individual jurisdictions can take leadership. And in fact, that's what's happening, whether we're talking California, uh, Scandinavia, even China. So that was the first. The second, though, is rigid pro and con views. Um, so many climate concerned people, so you notice I'm shifting over from the ones who couldn't really care as much about the climate, they, they prioritize other things, fine. Those of us who do care about climate, even 
cause our own problems. And that's really a key message of my book. So overcoming myths that hinder progress. So often it's to do with us holding those rigid pro and con positions on what our actions and policies are. And remember if I could take everybody and put them through that exercise that I do with the grad students in my course, it can get them away from being so rigid and so certain this one's right, that one's wrong. Whether it's using nuclear power, large hydropower, such a movement out there that we can't use biofuels. And I mean, there's, it's just crazy because there's all sorts of evidence of where we're already using biofuels and humanity has for a long time and, our, and, and look at the technologies for doing it in a cleaner, sustainable way. Uh, carbon capture and storage. So this is when you keep using fossil fuels, but you'd uh, uh, capture the CO2 rather than letting it go into the atmosphere and bury it underground. Um, we must or must not use carbon taxes. So you see these rigid pro and con views. And I must point out that the fossil fuel industry loves this rigidity. And so the message, don't let perfection be the enemy of good. Um, and in fact, uh, I'm going to take a little segue here, a, a detour into a book that I published uh, 15 years ago, uh, which was called Sustainable Fossil Fuels, The Unusual Suspect in the Quest for Clean and Enduring Energy. And the reason I did that is because I'd already been advising governments and you know, interacting with the public a lot in the area of sustainable energy and climate. And um, I was amazed at these rigid pro and con positions. And I was just thinking and saying to people, wait a minute, like, do you really think we're going to get jurisdictions like Alberta, Saskatchewan, and other places in the world who are really well endowed with fossil fuel resources? We're going to get them on side by telling them, oh, by the way, we have to annihilate your economy. So now come on with us and let's go do that. Um, and, and so then I asked, do you have to annihilate their economies? Um, and the, the evidence and the answers were no, that even something like carbon capture and storage uh, may end up, when humanity's moving hard, um, being one of the solutions that in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and elsewhere, we may produce hydrogen or electricity, capture the carbon, trade that product, that energy product, and still, in some respects, be competitive, possibly with renewables. Depends on the jurisdiction and so on. But my point of the book was to really be thinking about human bias uh, when we're trying to message to people what our options are out there. The third thing is what I'll call wishful thinking biases, and I can spend a lot of time on these and I don't want to, I wanna finish and get to our question period, but you have climate concerned people um, that, uh, that believe that energy efficient, efficiency investments save money. Uh, and therefore, you know, we, that, that ends up telling a politician, oh, we don't need any policies to price or regulate. Uh, the people are just going to naturally stop using or, or use way less energy. Um, that renewables are outcompeting fossil fuels. I already talked about that one. That fossil fuel subsidies are a game changer and, and that uh, divestment campaigns are a game changer. So I'm just going to leave those last two statements hanging out there. I'm not going to explain them. Um, perhaps if people are irritated with me, we can talk about it in discussion. And again, the message here is that the fossil fuel industry loves these wishful thinking biases because they divert people from the simple path, which is in an individual jurisdiction or country, it's electricity and transportation and it's pricing and regulations. Then there's another big category, which I call agenda hitching biases. So this is where people, we've taken so long now with decarbonization for the reasons, the three big reasons I mentioned at the beginning, which why it's such a difficult problem. And that's given other people to attach their own agendas to say, oh, you know what? To solve the climate problem, you have to get rid of capitalism or you have to, whatever it was that I wanted anyway. And those can be stop population growth, eating meat, flying planes, driving cars, uh, you got to achieve global equity and so on and so forth. So um, you must have all seen a lot of that. And in the book, I try to push back on that. Um, and, and in some cases, when I say push back, it doesn't mean that I'm opposed to less driving of cars or, uh, and myself, I, I eat meat two or three times a year, if that. Um, but, and I do want to see more global equity. They're, they're laudable, but when we hitch them to the climate pro challenge, it just makes it seem far more complex than it is. And um, I see, see far too much of that. And I think it's a paralyzing effect on the average climate concerned citizen. 
But again, the fossil fuel industry loves that. Now, my final one, uh, climate insincere politicians. Now, um, it's hard to find them sometimes, um, but uh, sometimes we're lucky and they actually pose together for a photo uh, and that makes it easy. But you know, what if they're what if they're a bit cleverer? What if they uh, what if they don't pose together for a photo? How can we spot them? Um, so, what is a climate insincere politician? They deliberately confuse actions and policies. They implement only non-compulsory policies. So now you have a you have a vocabulary to to see what's going on here. They exaggerate the cost of compulsory policies, like the carbon tax. Like they'll talk about the money that goes out of Saskatchewan with the carbon tax, and not the fact that the federal government then gives all the money back. And even to the typical household, I believe most of them would even get more back. Um, and so, of course, the fossil fuel industry loves and rewards these politicians. So. The task for the climate concerned citizen is to find and support those climate sincere politicians who are, it's the flip side here, implementing the compulsory policies in key sectors. A mix of policies also in the, uh, in the trade exposed industries, but there you do have to work more on innovation and maybe on policies that, um, uh, well, on policies that will ta put tariffs, charges on products from countries that are not implementing significant policies. And that's the second part of that bottom bullet. And the first one though, and this is interesting, is to lead multi-country coal and oil phase out campaigns. And I'll get back to that in a minute. So in other words, if your government is working domestically, say to phase out coal plants in your country, um, at the same time, that ha it has to be trying to play a lead role in making this happen uh, globally as well. And so that would be important. So then that leads me to this uh, question that I ask audiences, you know, is this a climate sincere politician, uh, building a pipeline and so on. And it's really fun in this part of the talk, whether I'm giving the talk in Vancouver, when everyone starts booing, um, or, you know, um, Alberta, where they all start booing, but it's for the opposite uh, uh, reasons. Um, but it, it is a different response around the province. But what I want to do in this next slide is show that, uh, well, what's actually gone on. Let's look at the evidence. And as a member of the IPCC, I'm on the chapter that reviews climate policy globally. Uh, and so my colleagues are like, oh my goodness, that's what Canada's been doing since 2015? What's its approach? Reliance on pricing and regulations with rising stringency, right? The compulsory policies levering its domestic efforts into a global effort. And now that was the, that's the main approach, that's the main descriptor of what Canada's been doing since 2015. And the specific policies are the coal plant phase out and then an international coalition that Canada played the lead in, in creating called Powering Past Coal. We have an economy-wide carbon price uh, that's rising towards $50 per ton of CO2 by 2022. We also have a carbon pricing system for the trade exposed industries, but it's one that um, gives them that right price for their, some of their internal investments, but make sure not to uh, completely uh, wipe out their competitiveness. And so the, there's a lot of fun discussions about this. I do a lot of research in this area. We're developing methane regulations and a clean fuel standard for coal, oil, and gas. So um, basically the policy's there. Um, and so that's why I leave people with, well, that's the policies. You'll have to decide if uh, you've got sincere or insincere politicians. And that was a big issue, of course, uh, in the last federal election. So now I'm gonna summarize. I'm finishing in the next couple of minutes. The simple path to climate success. Climate concerned citizens must simplify. We gotta work to elect and support climate sincere politicians, push them to implement these regulations or carbon pricing, push them to make alliances for global coal, gas phase out and carbon tariffs. And when they're doing that, like when your electricity system is, is low and is near zero emissions as it is now in British Columbia, because we, we elected not to build two coal plants 10 years ago when they were the cheapest option. And so now electricity, so I have electric car, and it's zero emission when I travel around and then putting um, and switching my house from a natural gas furnace to electric space heating and heat pump. 
But how do we get climate sincere politicians? And this is a, a key part of my book. And it's saying that your behavior really has to depend as a citizen, your political involvement, your citizen engagement um, really depends on that situation. And, and one of my students uh, was an engineer and he said, you should, when we were talking about this, you know, that it's if then kind of decision making, you should build a, a figure that shows that. So we built one. And so you start here and it says, so is that politician sincere? No, well, we're going to go down to some other kind of action. But if they do seem sincere, we still need to know if they have greenhouse gas targets, you know, meaningful targets, and if not. If yes, we still need to know if those targets are linked to policies. And if yes, we need to know if those policies are pricing and regulations, the compulsory policies. And if they are, uh, are they increasing in stringency? And you saw that as the carbon price is rising, the clean fuel standard should get tighter, and so on. And if that's the case, well then okay, you campaign for and fund that politician. If it's not the case, you're out there as a citizen expressing your displeasure with the government in power. And that's all kinds of civic activism, and I don't mean to prescribe any particular one for people. Uh, and of course, you have to see if it's working and that could lead you back into good space or, or you have to keep at it. And that's sort of the general sense of a strategic guide for climate concerned citizens. And you have to think about, you know, what does all that mean when it's something as desperate as climate? Um, Bill McKibben pointed out that, that planet Earth is miles outside its comfort zone. How many of us will go beyond ours? And I've been someone who's very lucky because uh, I am an expert. I get to express myself uh, uh, across the country before parliamentary committees. Uh, uh, this is me before uh, U.S. Congress Congressional Committee um, talking about the Keystone uh, Pipeline. So it's a privileged position, but even myself, I had to start uh, as in the period, to be honest, when the Harper government was in power and clearly was not a climate sincere government. I had to ask myself, what is my role as a citizen? What is civic activism? And I am not someone who's in favor of um, civil disobedience, um, but I do know from looking through history, there are times when that may make sense. And so you have to ask yourself that difficult question. And I came to that conclusion in 2011, tw no, 12, 13, with the government we had, that we needed to raise awareness of the climate insincerity. And I agreed to be part of a group blocking uh, coal train that was heading, uh, uh, sending coal to uh, uh, out from uh, building a new coal port in Vancouver. Um, that's me on my way into the into the paddy wagon with my handcuffs on. Um, people said, well, why are you and the police officer smiling at each other? And it's because of that moment he had just said to me, we've got to stop using coal. Um, so that was an encouraging uh, experience. But in the in recent issues with the oil pipeline in, in British Columbia, I have not been willing to demonstrate um, uh, or, or certainly not to do civic activism. And the reason is because I believe we, we have a fairly climate sincere government at the federal level for the reasons that you just saw. So it's a contingent kind of decision is the point I'm making. And then you ask yourself, though, what kind of activism? Well, I know that when Stephen Harper was defeated, a lot of voters were concerned about his um, climate insincerity. That, that The polling showed that. And so the responsibility then is on all of us. And you might say, well, what can one person do? Um, but then, as Greta Thunberg has said, no one is too small to make a difference. And... Um, uh, Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And I'll end with one last uh, uh, quote, Albert Einstein, those who have the privilege to know have the duty to act. So thank you very much. Um, there should be lots of clapping here about now, but anyway, I can't. Um, so I'll uh, try to get back to the Gallery. Oh, that's good. Everyone, we can do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Over to you, too. Um, so, I just would like to really take a, a moment now and ask people to give, you know, the silent applause of all the 
the finger waving is just such a beautiful thing to see. <laughs> so much love and appreciation coming to you, Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, you wouldn't have noticed this, but there have been a lot of um, questions coming in. Um, the first one uh, started at 2.37. So um, I'll just read this and Jeremy and I are gonna um, move back and forth in the Q&A to uh, read the questions that come in through the chat to, to Mark. And we're hoping to do the, um, the Q&A through this way seems like a little bit maybe more streamlined um, but if you're calling in from a telephone you can um, hit star nine and ask your questions that way and we'll just see how things move in this way and we may move to having people raise hands um, okay so the first question from from ben is my understanding is that the challenge with steel and concrete is not just that they are trade exposed but that we have actually, but that we actually don't have a way to produce them in any quantity or at a reasonable price without fossil fuels. Do you agree? Uh, so I, I'm, you can hear me right now. Yeah. Okay. Good. Um, yeah. Uh, no, we. Um, I talked about carbon capture and storage, and uh, so if you were still using coal as your main energy source uh, of course you're using a bit of the coal to get carbon in the steel but it's a really small percentage two percent or something um so you're using it for energy to get you really high temperature energy so in the industrial sector fossil fuels have been fantastic for material transformation because of their ability to generate such high temperatures um, and so the first thing is though if you're still using fossil fuels to make steel to make cement um, humans could have set this up and done carbon capture and storage. So literally captured the CO2 from the smokestacks. And we were capable of doing that 20 years ago. And I've had, um, I've looked at internationally, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change did a study on that. Um, and in most cases, it would lead to increases in the cost of production in the area of two to 5%. I never saw a single case where the cost of production would rise by more than 10%. So try to imagine, you know, the global economy and it's five to 10% more expensive to make steel and cement, but we save the planet. I mean, so this is sort of that kind of cost benefit analysis. That's just carbon capture and storage. We also do have, like within steel now, we're moving into other ways. And of course we could always do electric arc, uh, even electric arc on um, raw materials, not just on recycling. Um, and likewise, the ways that we can make cement. I mean, in, in cement, it isn't so much just the coal either, it's the process emissions. And there are process emissions in aluminum. So first of all, you can always capture carbon. But secondly, we, are move, we do have other technologies. And in fact, it's a former PhD student of mine, Chris Bataille, who's kind of the leading person in Canada and in, even one of the leading people internationally. And there's a chapter on this in the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change who works in this area and helps to supervise a couple of my students. And basically, so I'm not going to list through the technologies. And if I did, I'll probably botch it anyway. I'm an economist. Um, but we, well, there are technological options. These ones might raise the cost of production 10 to even 20% of the raw material. I mean, of the, the basic material, like the steel ingots. And then you'll find that the effect on the price of something made from steel, like a car, might be 2% higher. So we have the technologi technological capability to, to make these things without emissions. It's always a question of cost. Thanks. Great, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mark. Um, I'm gonna try and combine a couple of questions. This, the, the second question uh, came from Larry and was about was, was really asking you um, your uh, evaluation of the potential of BEC's uh, bioenergy with carbon capture and storage uh, as a technology. Um, but the, uh, the second comes from Travis, who, who says um, that there is some, uh, there, there, there are some concerns whether uh, bioenergy is truly sustainable um, and if you want to modify that question as he does um, how sustainable it is in comparison with other renewable technologies um, and uh, I guess what, what's your what, what's your take on that debate about um, the, uh, the sustainability of bioenergy and is this something that just raises more problems than, than, uh, than we can we can handle 
<clears throat> I, I really welcome that question. And so just to be clear for everyone, BEX just means bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. So meaning that um, you would grow something, uh, 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 wood or grains or something, grasses, and um, you would convert them into solid, liquid, gaseous product that you could combust or, you know, or yeah, that you could combust to make energy. And then in the smokestack, um, again, you would capture the carbon and, and, and bury it underground. So th what this means is that it would actually be a, a sort of a net negative. Um, you'd get energy, meaning you didn't have to burn coal somewhere, uh, and you'd also, be, the, the end of it would be a, a reduction in CO2 in the atmosphere. Then, so that's what it is, and if people ask me about that, um, I would say, of course, it's technologically feasible. It'll be a question of cost. And, and location. And that leads me to my answer to the second part of the question, which was, um, is it sustainable and so on? The, so nothing is completely sustainable like in, the, in the sense that, or no, nothing is free of a footprint on the earth. Human be each of us, we eat, we defecate, we all have material input or uh, impact. And so uh, that's the first thing I say when people say to me, is this a, you know, is this a green or a sustainable technology and this one isn't, I'll say we have to look at this mix of, 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 uh, uh, of all of the impacts, some of which are less desirable than others, and at location. So I would argue that bioenergy uh, of some kind in certain areas on the planet will end up if we just had a fair if we, we tried to control for the, the, the you know environmental impact so that it was at acceptable levels that my ecology colleagues would find acceptable that there will be places on earth where bioenergy is better uh, or or mixed together and i'll give you an example is brazil you know has been making biofuels for a long time um uh, ethanol from sugarcane and um there are studies that have said and, and so we've looked there's you know, initially Brazil did it in a really messy way. They weren't thinking about local environmental effects. Then there's been some real model developments in that. Um, and it's been quite fantastic. And people on the intergovernmental panel on climate change are saying, wait a minute, why hadn't we done that in sub-Saharan Africa? Like the jobs it would create. Um, and also people said, well, you can't do this because you'll knock down a rainforest. Well, I'm sorry, maybe parts of that rainforest are going down anyway. Um, for people who would use it to graze, you know, to, to graze cattle and make meat. And so you'd have been better to sustain that land. Like it's in other words, be realistic about what's going on. Um, so my point is not, so this is, I avoid rigid pro and con positions. If, if I were to talk about the transportation sector, I would, my bet would be that in Canada, um, maybe 80% of our reduction of gasoline and diesel will be because of electricity from renewables, wind and solar. Just as taking that out of the air. Maybe 20% will be biofuels, biodiesel, and so on. Maybe produced in Canada, maybe produced somewhere else. So it's interesting looking at Scandinavia right now, or Norway, I think Sweden's quite similar, and, and Finland. About 20% of the liquid fuels used in transportation in these jurisdictions, is the latest stuff I've seen, is in the 20% range. So that's similar to what I was just talking about. And now the Norwegians um, have made some deals with Malaysia where some, some of these um, plantations are meeting certain sustainability criteria for palm oil. Um, and then the Norwegians are moving rapidly on electric vehicles. So they're doing biofuels and electric vehicles at the same time. And it looks like electricity will be dominant. Um, but there'll be some bio, bio uh, energy. So that's kind of the qualified way in which I refuse to say this is good, uh, this is unsustainable, and this is sustainable. It all depends on how we regulate it and how we do it, and then what its economics are relative to alternatives in a given location. Thank you, Mark. The next question is coming from David. He asks, in addition to electricity and transport, isn't low-level space heating also a relatively easy target for local con con conversion to non-carbon energy? Space heating is about 30% of our energy use at this latitude. Passive solar and geothermal are both relatively cheap sources. Right. So um, I would agree. I mean, I'm always, you got to remember, natural gas is dirt cheap. So actually, 
the cheapest thing is to have uh, well, maybe not in Saskatchewan, but listen, in Vancouver, <laughs> would be to have a house that had almost no insulation in it and had a really inefficient natural gas furnace. That might be the cheapest option. And I, I say that because I know it upsets people. Um, but it's forcing you to think about, if you're talking cheapest, you got to think about economics. And economics is about capital cost and operating cost. And I can get you a really cheap furnace and I can uh, you know, build a two by four house. And in Vancouver, I only need really good heating three months of the year. So my total bill of natural gas is pretty cheap. So when people say it's cheap, they've got to really say, what was the price of natural gas? Because over the years, people have said to me, oh, we're going to build this building and look at all the money it'll save by being efficient. And then I ask, what was your forecast for natural gas? And I asked this 15 and 20 years ago. And I can tell you, I was, because I was trained by, you know, people who were just looking at the evidence, the earth's crust is full of fossil fuels. So all of us knew that the price of natural gas would be really cheap, even though other people were saying it's gonna go really high. So that's my point, is to be really careful uh, about what is cheap and what isn't. And then finally, when someone says geothermal, I'm not sure if they're meaning a ground source heat pump uh, for residential, which I'm gonna assume in Saskatchewan, or geothermal as we also talk about it, which is to drill even further down. Uh, or, or have hot rocks near the surface and so on. And again, the answer is similar to my biofuels answer that the economics are different from one place to the other. So I really uh, encourage people not to have rigid pro and con positions. This one's cheap, this one's not. We find, and I'm a, I'm a modeler of the whole system, that it really depends on location. Location's a big deal. Great, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm going to jump around a bit here to again try to put a couple of questions together um, and this relates to your point about what you call agenda hitching and you know that's something um, I'm very sympathetic to in terms of your, your position even though in fact I have the opposite position on the issues apparently that is I eat more meat than is good for me and I'm suffering very serious withdrawal symptoms from not being able to fly um, but uh, that's uh, be that as it may uh, you know there's um, uh, the, the, there are a couple of questions one which says um, uh, you're not really questioning the role of the capitalist system uh, about the mess that we're in and won't we have to address that if we're actually going to, to save the planet and the other says great to identify if a politician is climate sincere that's great for you if you only care about climate and not say indigenous rights um, when these things come into conflict citizens are left to confront a more complex reality and you know, my, my take on that would be to say um, people don't often come into politics necessarily to solve problems. They often come into politics to express values. And that's always going to lead to what you call agenda hitching. And I, I, I wonder in, in those two cases, how you would respond. Thank you. So I, um, right. So the, I'll try to uh, uh, unpack that. I'll, I'll, I'll make it simple about focusing on the capitalism issue. And then uh, if I miss on the second part, Jeremy, please jump in and just remind me. Um, so I have a chapter in the book. Um, and, well, I, and I tell a story that um, uh, Bronwyn Draney, who was the head of the Literary Review of Canada, I think she's finally retired from that. But I used to write for her when she begged me enough. And she wanted me to review Naomi Klein's book. I didn't know about it yet. This was before it actually appeared. And I said, no, I'm too busy. And then cleverly, she sent it to me. And, um, and then I, and she said, Mark, just take a look at the first few pages and then find someone that, we can, that will review it for us. Right? So very smart, uh, because I started to read it and was quite outraged. <laughs> so basically, Naomi Klein said, and so Bronwyn knew that then I would read it and do the review. Um, Naomi Klein was, uh, well, I mean, she wants to get rid of capitalism. And so uh, she did, a, we had the big recession in 2008, 2009, and she said, that's the end of capitalism, wrote a book on it. Then we've got climate change, and she said, that's the end of capitalism, and wrote a book on it. And I'm expecting her book soon on the pandemic and how we got to get rid of capitalism. Um, but basically her message was that fossil fuels are all bad and we can all see this. It's so obvious. And we would all just move away from fossil fuels, but capitalism and corporations are preventing us from doing this. And to make that thesis, 
she, what she said is, look at me, I'm looking at the IPCC, I, you, can, you know I'm objective because I agree with the climate science. And so then I said, oh good, I expect you to look at the other stuff, like where we've reduced emissions and why was this successful? And instead she ignores all the rest of the IPCC and says, fossil fuels are just evil, humans wouldn't use them if they weren't foisted upon them by capitalists. And that's just so counter to why humans have used fossil fuels and the message that I gave at the beginning of my talk, which is just how fantastic fossil fuels are. And this is more Faustian than anything. It's that they have done wonderful things for humans and then they're gonna destroy the planet if we burn them openly. And so people can't get their cognitive head around that. And in my view, she couldn't get her head around it. Like she had to say that fossil fuels are evil uh, in order to make her thesis. And that meant she had to distort all sorts of stuff. Secondly, she wasn't able to sort of recognize the global nature of the problem. And so then I have a chapter on, in my book on that, which is, you know, how hard it is for, because of our, you know, like the selfishness to the extent that we have it as individuals or even relative to other tribes or people that we feel in competition with. And I'm, I'm saying humans have so much good in them, but we see this and global diplomacy is a depiction of that. And to sort of pretend that that's the fault of capitalism, that societies have always been, you know, distrustful, not able to work together. So I wrote it, I write part of a chapter on pointing out that we didn't even ally ourselves to stop the threat of Hitler. Hitler created the alliance against Hitler. He, he actually declared war on the United States before Roosevelt could get Americans to declare war on Hitler. He attacked the Soviet Union, you know, all of these things. So we aren't good at global, dealing with global problems like this. So there's the fossil fuel, that, and that's why at the beginning of my talk, I focus on this things. And finally, the failings of our democratic systems. And so um, that's my challenge to an argument like that. Now, are you saying, we can't solve it, that capitalism can make it harder to solve this. You could argue that. Um, you could argue that there are people who have, you know, taken the money from fossil fuels and used it in our very imperfect democratic system, uh, and I talk about that, to influence where things are at. Um, so that's why I think our chances of success are not great. You know, in, in, and I thought that 25 years ago, that we would move late on this problem, and I still think uh, we will. Um, but the final point was just about, you know, whether it's indigenous rights or other objectives, how can I be just so uh, energy focused and climate focused? We have a whole bunch of other objectives out there, and I agree completely. I am not against people having those objectives. They play out no matter what, and they should. And there are people who are, have less power in our society and those who have more, and that's always sort of affected me politically and how I am as a citizen. But I also say, we really need to solve this climate problem. And not so much indigenous people in our country, but I'm thinking about the rest of the world where poor people are not going to do well with climate change. And I think right now they're not gonna do well with COVID. I'm really worried about Africa. Those are the people that don't have the institutional structure, the governance structure, the societal organization to deal with climate change. So to me, we've got to focus on climate change if we care about global equity. Sorry for ranting. That was totally cool. great, thank you. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to um, ask a question from, from Mark on his behalf. Uh, a Green New Deal, especially at a global scale, will inherently require a transition period and then an implementation one. Very little has been said about their social and environmental costs. The need for mineral will explode. What are they? Where are they? Uh, so I think I'm going to guess here that Mark is talking so I, there was a bunch of things in there that I didn't necessarily connect. So I'm gonna make some assumptions that the point about minerals is to do with the rare earth minerals that we might be using in um, uh, batteries and, uh, and um, uh, solar panels and things like that. Is that your guess, Sarah, where Mark's going with this? Okay, um, the, but, so, but then the Green New Deal, I, I think, if we're talking about rare earths and minerals, that's part of decarbonization. The Green New Deal is something put forward by Democrat 
um, activists in the US who wanted to link up with what Roosevelt did in the 1930s by using the word the New Deal. But it's for me, that's has always been a challenge because um, the New Deal was at a time of very high unemployment, like long run structural unemployment. So it was the idea that you needed government investment to kickstart uh, the American economy and even in other economies around the world. And, and so that was what the New Deal was. A Green New Deal has a couple of premises that are problematic for me in a functional way. One is that, um, is that we, 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 right now we're in temporary high unemployment, but basically when people came up with this idea, uh, we were not at high unemployment. Um, the Canadian American economies were at, uh, were doing quite well. And so the idea of what would, the, the word New Deal was a bit, was strange. And then the idea that invest, government investment is essential for a transition. And um, it's not like that. So that's what I talk about in the book. It's actually policies that get individuals, firms, uh, building managers to get electric heat pumps or electric vehicles or bring in more biofuels if that's the case. Um, and it's 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 going government money won't get you there and in fact um like when california did these major initiatives that have helped us have hybrid cars then plug-in hybrid cars and now electric cars like they're what's called the low emission vehicle standard the ultra low emission vehicle standard and so on those policies didn't involve much government money at all there was some tax breaks and things federally and so on for innovation but really it, it's the reductions don't need government spending to happen, they need compulsory policies. And then just looping back to the minerals question, um, I, I, there's the strong evidence that humans can do pretty well at innovating away from the scarce minerals. Uh, and there's just so much evidence on that over the last 100 years. Um, so I'm not as concerned about that. And it's sometimes used as an excuse for not decarbonizing. Do we need to help with transition like with workers who are in a sector that is phasing out, although it's not gonna phase out that fast, but of course you need to help them with that transition, absolutely. And uh, Mark, this is Mark, I was the one asking the question. Um, so if we look at a world that tomorrow will be using a mix of fossil fuels and uh, renewables, you still need a huge ramp up in, um, anything you know solar panels um wind turbines um carbon ca carbon capture storage you have you you have so much that at this moment in time some studies have been done that we just don't have enough minerals so betting that oh you know we'll improve the capacity of whatever is built today is again you know you're talking about sincere and insincere politicians that's also a bet in the future that will be capable of doing this and yet the big problem that we've been facing all along is um, we're just growing in on a finite planet there is no degrowth policy we're not addressing really the um, I, I won't call it the elephant not to insult the elephant but the monster um, that is in the in the closet which is that growth we're just consuming too much Okay, thank you. Now I, now I get what you're getting at. Um, I think humans are going to be challenged with um, material-based growth. And, um, and so dealing with the issue of greenhouse gas emissions will lead to higher energy and material costs. And those things lead to a greater conservation, both conservation and demanding less, like so services, I don't know, mobility, uh, the size of your house, uh, but also inefficiency gains. And there will be uh, material substitution. So I'm an economist who is, look, and I'm, my next book is going to be um, on, it's called, Must We Stop Economic Growth? And um, I would argue you don't need to stop economic growth, but it'll be a very different kind of economic growth. It'll probably be uh, largely medically related, to be honest. It won't be, and if there's any material energy throughputs, they will be, um, well, like the, the professor at MIT who's been developing um, organic uh, uh, solar panels, right? So that you can throw them in the compost afterwards. I mean, these are the kind of things that do need to happen. So I'm agreeing with you on our constraints, but 
um, I just nervous, and maybe you weren't doing this, if people just have this static view, like, oh, you use this much of this to make tur wind turbines, I'll multiply it by all the electricity you need to replace all the coal and natural gas, and that's how much we will need globally, and we don't have that resource. When you analyze resource quantities, they are very much a function of price. And um, there's great work on this. Uh, uh, Robert Ayers is one of the leading scholars on this, like the whole the mineral threshold. Uh, and so this is a big part of my, uh, uh, my reading and some of my research. And so I think it's really important not to do static analysis, but to think about dynamics, which is difficult. There's a lot of uncertainties. Thanks, Mark. I'd like uh, to, um, again, follow my synthetic approach and try and combine a, a couple of questions. So, so Thomas wants to press you on the pipeline purchase. Um, what about buying that pipeline? Doesn't that make uh, our Prime Minister a climate insincere politician? And um, the, the, the second question, I think, has the same subtext. It comes from Gary. Um, uh, is Canada on track to reduce emissions to meet the IP? PCC uh, uh, target for, for 2030. Uh, and I guess um, if not, then uh, how can we talk about a, a, a climate sincere politician who embraces the, the, the goal but not the means to reach it? Right. Thanks. So um, um, maybe the questioner is a British Columbian or something. I don't know. Like, it, because I get this question in, I didn't expect this question in Saskatchewan, darn it. Um, uh, so I get this all the time in British Columbia. And it's, it, it, what I do is I kind of just throw it right back. Um, I'll, I'll sort of tease people and say, well, you know, politics is all about trade-offs. And you and I can't seem to get elected. And if I got elected, well, I wouldn't get elected. Because it's like, I'm, I would be, we all got to do this, but most Canadians don't support that. Um, you know, my, I helped Elizabeth May in the last election develop her policies uh, after she told me we're going to do a 60% reduction by 2030. And I said, oh my goodness, that's expensive. Let me try to see what we can do there and then maybe you'll get elected, but I don't think you'll get more than 12% of the vote. So you got you to gotta try to get people's votes to become a government and that involves trade-offs. So um, I and my research group and um, you know, even talking to my offspring who are all adults now, we talk about the real world of politics. It's about figuring out how you can get a coalition of people who don't have the exact same views as you to come along so that you can do things that need to happen. So it's about compromise. You don't get to have a green um, uh, eco dictatorship. Um, so I can, I can, I wasn't in favor of buying the pipeline by Trudeau, but I can support that. I mean, I can, I can defend that. I can explain why he did it. And this would be, so my exercise for you would be, Give us the best arguments why, if you were in government trying to do greenhouse gas policy, you would have bought that pipeline. Now, let me get, give me the best arguments. And, uh, and if I gave you that exercise, maybe you would do it. But I, let me just pretend, okay, what would be the best arguments? The best arguments would be, well, here's one. Um, in uh, Canada had a big fight over national unity uh, a couple of times, but certainly in, when Chrétien was prime minister, I can tell you that all climate policy fell right off the board while we had that fight for years and years. And I promise you a similar, uh, I'm, I'm not certain, I think there's high probability that a similar thing would happen in Canada if the Canadian federal government didn't pay attention to the people who were able to elect majority governments in Saskatchewan and Alberta. Even though there's lots of people in those jurisdictions who might feel differently, those were the governments that came out, national crisis. So I can, I can think of an argument where you'd say, you know what, at the end of the day, we need to stop burning oil on the planet. So here's how, like the Norwegians, we're going to still export some oil while we go to zero emission transportation and we become part of a global movement for that. And when that happens, the oil pipelines won't matter. They won't be built anymore. You won't be expanding oil sands. So that would be the kind of argument for that. When you say what the IPCC wants by 2030, I think you mean, so I don't know if you're, if you're talking about the 1.5 degree limit that was mentioned in Paris, it's not so much what happens in 2030, people talk more about 2050. Um, and I, I don't think any government, I, I don't expect any government to hit their targets. And I really wouldn't lose sleep over that. I wouldn't, end up helping Andrew Scheer get elected because Trudeau wasn't gonna hit his target. 
If Trudeau is putting in carbon pricing and regulations, which are so difficult to do politically, and he's increasing the stringency, and we're able to just get him reelected, that's amazing. Because the most likely scenario in the last federal election was that we would go back to Stephen Harper II, uh, which would be somebody who was climate insincere and would unravel the carbon price, would not put in the regulations. So I sort of challenge you, or in British Columbia, you're sort of getting a little taste of the big discussions in British Columbia leading up to this last election. Um, I would just challenge you to say, okay, what do you do in this world of compromise? Are you like, don't let perfection be the enemy of good because then you won't get anything. That's, that's my challenge. I'm not sure if I'm right, but that would be my challenge. Sarah, you're muted. Yes, sorry. <laughs> that. Um, so, uh, yeah, uh, thank you for that, Mark and Jeremy. Um, it's 3.30. And I just wanted to let people know that that's our time for finishing. But if everyone's keen, and Mark, are you keen to take a few more questions? Sure. Okay. So um, I'm going to also wrap a few in into the theme of capitalism. Um, Mark, again, he's, um, he's indicating that you're not really questioning the role of our capitalist system into the mess we're in. Infinite growth on a finite planet. Okay, number one there. Um, I've, I've answered that one. Okay. Um, thank you. And so I'm saying there could be infinite growth on a finite planet, but material energy throughput, um, well, energy throughput could increase 10,000 fold um, in human societies over the next 200 years, and that could be sustainable. Material throughput could increase but the material throughputs in the economy have to be close to biomimicry. And what that means is um, the inputs have to be things that, um, you know, that we can substitute and, and still have those inputs coming in. They have to be high exergy, that's high energy quality, uh, high enough. And we'd have to have a lot of innovations that figured out how to store energy, which we're already doing. Um, and then the materials are really going to have to be either uh, benign when they go back out into the environment, so they're absorbable, like the human history, uh, you know, human systems were like that for thousands of years, um, or any toxic elements to them have to be captured and stored. Um, and, and then the, most of them would be recycled, and that would make your, your economic system more expensive. And that means the material and energy throughput would be way lower than it is today. And our footprint would be way lower, but you could still have dramatic economic growth over 200 years. And I would call that sustainable. Yes. Okay. And just following, so a comment from Garth, we need a system with, a diff with different values. If we aspire for more stuff, then we tend to not care about degradation of um, the mother earth in the history of our world systems change sorry, in the history of the world systems change, and it seems it might not be about time for this system change. It seems it might be about time for this system change, sorry. And I just want to add um, another question here from Kim. What opportunities exist to increase public awareness of greenhouse gas, um, grasses mitigation priorities you've addressed today, particularly in jurisdictions led by climate insincere politicians? Right. Okay. If, if I forget the second one, um, I can re come back to me on that. Yeah. Um, but the first one I did. So this is interesting because our discussions are much more almost about political economy um, than they are what I expected, which is great because um, I I think and write a lot about that as well. Uh, it would. So I'm someone. I'm in my sixties now. Um, I live in a nice old wooden house in Vancouver. It'll be like the seventh house that I've um, redone to get down to near zero emissions. I'm someone who's never had a, a parking pass at the university. I use bus and transit, and I try to have a very low in, uh, you know, footprint, but I'm sure I have a footprint. Um, that's inevitable. Um, but what I also am is I highly respect the other human beings around which I live, and I respect or I, I, accept, I, I, I accept and try to change some of their values and their focus, but I also understand that I'm not a dictator. And so if I want change towards sustainability in my society, and in some cases, you know, we do better in some things, it's where the impacts are more local, 
we do less well where the impacts are farther away from us. And these things are all obvious. It's kind of like related to humans and how they how their focus is is on their own well-being and those around them who they love and those who are in their tribe and so on. So I have to accept that world as it is, or I can just sit back and be delusional and say, everybody's going to hell, you're all bad unless there's total system change and you all start to think like me. So that is one way to do it. You know, you can just complain. And I'm not saying you're a complainer by asking this question, but to me, it's like, okay, but you're telling me that you democratically are going to go out and get everyone to completely change the system. Um, and I hope you can do it in a decade or so, because that's all the time we've got. Uh, and what I'm saying is you're making the you're making the problem more complicated than it is. Right now, we need to address climate change, and there's a simple path to get that done. And it really involves not agenda hitching. Um, that makes it harder. Um, but when we solve that, does that mean we've solved everything about sustainability? Absolutely not. And in fact, at the, the last chapter of my book, 15 years, 16 years ago, Sustainable Fossil Fuels, I threw a bone to my, I said, to my friends who are, uh, you know, love to be complaining about the world. Don't worry, I've got good news for you. Um, the, the, you know, the bad news for you is that it looks like we can solve climate change quite quickly. The good news for you is that we are, you know, appropriating the Earth's surface in ways that are, are very dangerous and exhilarating so you can still be upset at night and so on. And I don't mean to say that just flippantly. Um, there's so many ways that human existence has gotten so much better than it was in 1350 or in 350 um, or in 1650. And I really study human health and society throughout history. And I'm amazed at how many people don't know much about that. Um, and they'll say, look how horrible it is right now. It's like, nope, uh, compare it to something. Um, so absolutely, humans are hugely challenged. We need a systemic change. I'm trying to show you with this book how we can make progress in one key area. And uh, that's the most urgent right now. That's my point. Yeah, what was your second? Uh, well, I can reread it. What opportunities exist to increase public awareness of greenhouse gas mitigation priorities you've addressed today, particularly in jurisdictions led by climate insincere politicians? Yep. So my story about what people like me were trying to do uh, across the, the country uh, under the Harper government uh, is an example for you. And that's where, um, you know, if Andrew Scheer had won this election, um, I, I worked hard to expose what his, what his policies would do. Uh, and one of my uh, studies was quoted widely in the media throughout the election campaign because we simulated his policies and and we were amazed but they actually led to an increase in emissions and when I wrote that in a policy options piece that was quoted in the media throughout the election campaign um, but you know when I've been in situations let's say in British Columbia uh, 15 years ago we had the Gordon Campbell government that was, um, didn't care at all about climate from 2001 to 2005. Uh, I joined forces with people like David Suzuki and others um, doing public talks continuously, but also lots of, so okay, I can give a public talk. A lot of people might not have that opportunity as I pointed out in my, in my slides. Um, but there's so much activism that people did in British Columbia and eventually Gordon Campbell flipped and then we ended up being the leader in North America with a carbon tax. Um, we enacted a policy in electricity that I helped design that stopped two coal plants and I was working with the Alberta government at that time, darn it, and, um, and one of the utilities and we almost prevented a coal plant from being built in Alberta and then they said, nah, we'll build it and it's just so irritating to me because I and others had said, then you'll be closing that down in 15 years. Um, uh, but so yeah, the activism is really important and there are really good activists in Canada and I try to support them. Great, thank you. Maybe I could throw in a couple of, of uh, this time unrelated questions just to, uh, to touch on things we haven't really touched on yet. Um, one is, is uh, related to something I noticed too in your talk in which you described that the, the costs of decarbonization would be modest. And that's an interesting choice of words. So uh, someone has a Saskatchewan example here. Um, would taxing electricity not reduce the competitiveness of domestic companies that consume large quantities of electricity and compete internationally? 
For example, Nutrien is one of the largest consumers of electricity in Saskatchewan, with rising electricity prices not significantly reduce their international competitiveness. So Nutrien uh, is a, what we would have once described as a fertilizer in an old fashioned way uh, uh, company. Um, the, uh, the other, which is interesting to me with my, all my flying, is apparently in the book you come out strongly against offsets. Um, can you provide a summary of, of, of why? Okay. okay, so yeah, so this is what we, we do is uh, I and I, I mean I work with scholars around the world, Most, much of my work um, in estimating the costs of abatement relies on um, technology information. I use a lot the US Department of Energy just because they actually have a really good vetting system and they're less optimistic. Um, but, and then a lot of the modeling work is coordinated either through Stanford University's Energy Modeling Forum, which is doing this for 25 years. They're, they're really rigorous. And the International Institute of Applied Systems Analysis, which is just outside of Vienna. And so, you know, we have to work on that issue of modeling what is the real cost. And one of the things I do when I, when I model in Canada, for example, is I always try to show what does it mean if for, in the cost of electricity. So just the example that you uh, laid out. Um, and so in Saskatchewan, if over you know, a 15 year period, and this was modeling done five years ago, so this is like the 2030 target of phasing out coal plants, put in some, whatever was your lowest cost mixture that got your emissions down 80, 90%, what would be the effect on the price of electricity in Saskatchewan? So you're looking at, okay, wind and solar is getting really cheap, but it's non-dispatchable. So it's, you know, when does the wind blow? So you're gonna have to match that with energy storage, but actually you can store energy as natural gas. So you can have a bunch of natural gas turbines that are sitting there hardly ever operating, but they're there to give you firming when you need it. So what is the effect on, the, and then you already have your existing capital stock. You know, you've even got your boundary dam facility. I know the carbon and capture and storage was expensive. It's the first one off, but it's there now. So if I look at sunk costs and everything, the, and I, I don't know the exact number for Saskatchewan, but we actually did a report on this for the C.D. Howe Institute about seven or eight years ago. Um, the cost, you know, increased the price of electricity about 15 to 20 percent for a residential customer uh, over a 15 year period. So one percent per year uh, is, would be the increase. For industrial customers, it was more like 5% a year because they don't have all of the distribution costs rolled into their price of electricity. I used to chair the BC Utilities Commission, so I really know price structures. So it then, the, you know, and then most emission intensive industries don't actually, electricity is not a huge part of their cost of production. Now, I have to confess that for nutrient, uh, I don't know. But I've had people say to me, oh, electricity is really important to these guys. And I'll end up finding out, yep, they use quite a bit of electricity. Oh, you know, a 15% a increase or a 10% increase in price over so many years um, will lead to a 0.2% increase in their cost of production. And by the way, during that period of the electricity price going up, they will be looking at ways to use less electricity. And so their electricity intensity, you can't just take the static value today of what is their electricity intensity per ton of fertilizer. It'll go down by 10, 15, 20% over that 10 year period while the price is going up. So you'd be amazed how often, and we've looked back historically, that policies that were increasing the price of fuel or electricity didn't have the big production cost differences. Now, if they're using a lot of oil or coal or something, and I put a carbon tax directly on that, that could, uh, I don't know that industry, but you know, a steel plant, that would really affect the cost of production. And that's why my whole talk was about how do you treat differently emission intensive trade exposed industries. Um, and so on. So I don't know enough about the fertilizer one, but that's why it might not be as devastating as you might think. The other question was about offsets. Oh yeah. Um, so yeah, the uh, uh, that's a long one, <laughs> but basically an offset 
is you or me paying someone else to reduce emissions um, because we couldn't reduce ours. We had to get on an airplane and the air companies, I mean, I flew in a, in a bio jet fuel airplane in Brazil 15 years ago. Um, we've been able to produce this stuff for a very long time and even the hi hydrogen jets and so on. We don't do it because we don't have the policies. Nobody's, we don't compulsory policies. So instead, people cook up, they say, you know what? You feel guilty about flying in an airplane. Um, give me some money and I will reduce emissions somewhere else from what they otherwise would have been. And that leads to this big debate of what would they otherwise have been? And so you actually have to do, um, like the offset companies will say, oh, don't worry, we went out there and verified. We verified that that person invested in a hydropower project, or we verified that they didn't cut those trees down or that they planted those trees. And, and we've got gold standard verification. And I'm afraid to tell you, but all that verification doesn't mean anything. The, the way a social scientist and parasist would look at that, this is to say, I need an, uh, some kind of natural experiment where I can see what really would have happened. It isn't what the hydropower or the electric utility tells me, I need to know what would happen. So people who've studied this, I'll give you one example. They said, oh, you know, Europe was reducing emissions and then it set up an offset system to give money to China. And then the money to China went for hydropower projects. And then the Europeans could just keep polluting, their industries keep polluting, they sent the money to China for hydropower projects. <clears throat> Later we showed that the number of hydropower projects being built in China over a 10 or 15 year, it didn't, didn't change at all with that money. The Chinese were building these projects anyway. And then suddenly they said, oh, you're giving us free money to offset 15% of the costs or whatever, great. And now look, you can tote this up as something that reduced emissions and you can still get on an airplane or, um, you know, or keep your, your plant running. So that's a short version of the the empirical analysis that that has to go on and again it's interesting because i'm on the uh, i'm on the intergovernmental panel on climate change uh, policy chapter and we're struggling with all this stuff again you know the, the latest research on offsets and so on um not everyone's in agreement but that's that's i would say if i brought together the leading scholars 18 of 20 would basically agree with what i just said to you right there and the other two are probably running offset programs of their own. Yeah. I didn't want to say that, but <laughs> okay. uh, we ended up with a, I, I don't want to go too far, but we ended up with a conflict of interest issue that is very close to what you're just describing. <laughs> Mark, could you actually speak to that point you had at the end of your PowerPoint, which was removing fossil fuel subsidies is a game changer? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Uh, it isn't a game changer. Yeah. That's a wishful thinking bias. Yeah. And, and I mean, so yes, I, I almost feel bad just throwing it out there. I think of that as a teaser for the book uh, when I do it in a public talk, because it's not really fair to the audience. I'm not explaining it. So I'll, I'll explain very briefly uh, right now. <clears throat> so first of all, um, there's, and we're working on this again in the IPCC, uh, fossil fuel subsidies, how do you define what they are? It's not easy. So for, there are studies that say, well, it's the fact they can use the atmosphere for free. So we're not really counting that. The subsidies are supposed to be ones that help the fossil fuel industry relative to other industries in the economy. So it would be a tax break, a gift of money from government, whether for R&D or actually just to lower the cost by helping pay for a port or a, something like that. So people try to <clears throat> tote these up and, <clears throat> and then say, okay, yeah, looks like there's some subsidies. We can't agree. How big are they? Da, da, da. When you do this globally, by the way, three quarters of the subsidies are for consumers in a few countries where politically the governments haven't been able to get the price of gasoline up to its market value. So it's usually oil exporting countries like OPEC countries, um, you know, so Venezuela, but also other developing countries and Egypt and so on where they're, it's crazy. They are subsidizing consumption. But when you look at the other 25%, which is the debatable amount that subsidizes production, so it's like, oh, you're subsidizing fossil fuels and that's why they're cheap. That's the assumption people are making. The evidence does not bear that out. 
Um, and so the International Energy Agency and others have done simulations of their global models where they remove different amounts of subsidies from the production side. And what happens is those entities that got the pr production, maybe they produce a little bit less. So maybe oil sands would produce a little less in a world without subsidies. Saudi Arabia would produce a little bit more. The global price of oil would be the same and the global amount of emissions would be the same. So again, it's a lack of understanding the dynamics of markets. And I don't, I mean, I argue with economists all the time, um, but that's where economists, we work on the dynamic effect and we often see that people don't get that. Um, so the analysis shows you remove the subsidies, it's not gonna get rid of the emissions. And it's, it's because the earth's crust is full of oil. I have to say that over and over again, or substances that can be made into oil, whether it's oil sands or even coal, or whatever, we can convert them into oil. South, South Africa converts um, coal into oil, and we knew how to do that <clears throat> for a century. So, um, <clears throat> and then what would be the cost of oil, and what would that mean to the demand? The cost of oil, the price of oil could be the same, could be higher a little bit, could be lower. So it won't change the demand for oil. The only thing that will change the demand for oil is regulations that phase out technologies using oil, or that phase out fuels, or pricing that does that. What about stopping subsidies and using the money for something else? Yeah, but if you're not, um, so we do subsidies and with like for something else, we do, so we give subsidies to renewable energy and so on. Um, but what happens is if oils, uh, if, if fossil fuels start to lose market share, their price goes down. And this is my point is, <clears throat> The innovation that, you know, people say we need more innovation. The innovation in fossil fuels in the last 15 years has been tremendous, right? We developed fracking. We developed ways of, uh, you know, using steam to get oil out of oil sands. As somebody said, we burn a whole bunch of fossil fuels, uh, natural gas, in order to get a lot of heat to then take bitumen, like basically asphalt, and then convert it into liquid oil. Like it sounds insane, but it's actually, you know, it's, it's still economic, it would be still economic at a global price, a world oil price of $50, $60. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an important thing for people to understand. And that's a key message of my book. Lots of people are charming in, chiming in, they're charming in too. <laughs> 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 exactly. Um, so uh, here's a last question from me because I think we, uh, I'm getting signals from people that we're going to need to draw this uh, to a close. So there is, I notice, buried in the the, 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 uh, the chat here, a question about the, so the, the so something you said you would talk about in uh, answering the questions that you didn't talk about, and that's the impact of of, of COVID nineteen. Um, are we just going to go back to business as usual, um, or uh, is this going to have a lasting impact on, on, on the, um, the, the climate debate? Right. Thanks for asking that, because I forgot, and I, um, you know, in fairness, I want um, to touch on that. I think it's probably on lots of people's minds. And, and the reason I wanted to touch on it, though, I am on a, what's called the Canadian Institute of Climate Choices. So we're a group of experts from across the country. It's a new institution created by the federal government um, a year or so ago. And, you know, so some of us are economists, other expertise, and, um, and so governments say to us, hey, help us out. What, what uh, um, and, and, you know, what could we do as part of the economic uh, recovery stimulus that might also contribute to our goals for greenhouse gas reduction? And many of my friends who are environmentalists, um, uh, also have talked about, uh, it sort of melded it with the Green New Deal language, which is we need to invest in our economy <clears throat> because we're in a big mess economically, and therefore let's invest in green stuff. Um, and, uh, but yes, give money to help with the transition for workers in the fossil fuel industry. <clears throat> this sounds great. And I think it was, uh, but I think it's, it's, it's misdepicting what happened and what will happen. That's why I'm um, commenting on it and why I didn't make it the main thrust of my talk. Um, because, and, and I've heard people use the word rebuild, like as we rebuild our economy. <clears throat> and I'm almost seeing this now as a kind of agenda hitching. It's like, I want decarbonization because of COVID, 
a pandemic, governments have shut down the economy. So I'm gonna to try to hitch my carbon climate objectives to the rebooting of the economy. And I understand the, the, the reason for that, and that's fine, but it, it needs to be um, accurate, like it needs to fit the facts. <clears throat> In the recession in 2008 to 2010, we did have cases where there was capital stock, some of it that wouldn't even be used anymore. Things were, there was a mess. There was housing stock that was, there was been a housing bubble. Um, <clears throat> there were things that had been built um, on shady financing because the financial sector was a mess. And so our economy had some real reckoning that happened in the 2008 all the way to 2012 period and government stepped in but most of what governments did was not rebuild the economy. So I object to that word. It was reboot the economy. And in this case with COVID, I don't see how it's anything but rebooting the economy. Um, that governments are only providing, and what macroeconomists are talking about right now is a bridge. They're saying we've deliberately, we had a full, we had a full uh, employment, close to full employment economy. And then we closed it down but all the capital stock, so we economists say capital stock, the physical things, the cars, the planes, the trucks, the restaurant buildings, the offices, the schools, the universities. And those are the things, as you know from my talk, that determine greenhouse gas emissions, at least energy related ones. It's when you heat them, it's when you drive them, it's when you fly them. And it's not like we're suddenly going to get different airplanes. The airplanes are there. And when the demand comes back up, we're going to refuel them. So we're going to reboot the economy, not rebuild the economy. That's what is likely to happen. And that's unfortunate. I mean, it's, it's unfortunate in the sense of wanting real change. Like, couldn't we just crush those airplanes? Couldn't we just crush those cars? Couldn't we just burn down some of those buildings and so on and so forth? But actually, it, it really looks like it won't be like that. But that, so what is the most important strategy at this time, which I'm very involved in, that you will notice that the oil industry, I haven't paid attention to the coal industry, but the oil industry has said, so the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers, you better just slow down or stop with carbon price increases and regulations, you know, the rising stringency of these things. And to me, that's where the battle is fought. It is, it is in government investment. It's going to be what we do as individuals and firms, and we have to hold the line on these policies and even try to get that stringency going up. And at least in some jurisdictions, and I'm certainly involved in discussions in British Columbia and at the federal level, I've been quite uh, happy with what I've been hearing. But it, it isn't gonna be at least this image that some of my environmentally oriented and, and really sincere, smart, climate sincere people uh, climate concerned people, um, it just doesn't fit this sort of language of major government investment and, um, and rebuilding this economy that went bad. To me, it's just firing it up again. And it's very, and in fact, there's some real risks here. Oil prices down, as you know, I, you know, <clears throat> when the demand falls for something, its price goes down, as I pointed out 15 years ago, I pointed out in this book, we've all known this as energy economists. And that's really, um, and then it's going to be real hard. Like we, in a place like British Columbia, we were getting up to 10, 12, 15% of people, but the new cars being sold were electric. We were actually getting more into middle class people, not just <clears throat> people who were wealthy and buying these for status reasons, so Tesla, or kind of the, my group who are wealthy enough uh, and old enough and you know, said, okay, I'm going to go with my partner and we together bought an electric car and we were getting into more people that might have kids and so on. And I think that, that's going to get wiped out because they'll just sit there and say, oh my goodness, electric cars are more expensive. Um, oil is really cheap now. This is not the time to go out and buy an electric vehicle. So this is where the, the zero emission vehicle standard that British Columbia has that we're hoping to get federally, those things need to keep increasing in stringency. That's the, the battle to be fought. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Are we good? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a lot. Actually, I look forward to watching the, the recording because there was a lot of, it was very dense. Thank you so much for sharing so much. And uh, we're getting lots of thank yous in the comments. Um, 
I sense that people really appreciated being able to spend this time with you. Um, yes, thank you, Mark. Yeah, giving the, the wave of thanks. <laughs> Well, and, and, and please let me say that um, I appreciated all the work that you did to set this up uh, and the opportunity after our initial frustration, because I did want to get out there and have a dinner with people and have some fun, and maybe we'll do that in the future. I also want to say I thought the questions were just excellent. I mean, I thought, I thought we were going to just talk about how to get rid of capitalism for a while there, but uh, then it weaved in nicely. And I actually love capitalism type questions. Anyway, so I really want to pre thank everybody for those excellent questions. It was, and I hope I didn't sound too much like I was ranting. I tend to get excited in question period. <laughs> well, the stage is yours, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, yes, it's nice that you're commenting on the great questions. We've had that with our Academics for Climate series. And I just want to take this opportunity to let everyone who's still here know that if you're interested in um, our series, we did record and they will be up soon. Um, our talks, Mark's, Mark's presence in the Academics for Climate series is number nine, um, the first one that's been online. Um, so we have a Facebook page and um, yeah, they'll be available online soon. And um, yeah, did, uh, was, were those your last words, Mark, or am I cutting you off? Or okay? No, I'm I'm just fine, and I, again, just thank you so much. Um, I really appreciated it. Yeah, it was it was really great to sit with you, um, and I want to say thanks to Jeremy Rayner um, as well for really helping with the questions and co-sponsoring too, and also um, Ben. Ben Roberts for Now What? And um, maybe Ben would like to say a few things about Now What as your season just wraps up. Sure, just very quickly as I know we're um, past the designated time, but thank you to everyone who, who stuck around. I think we had a, we had a really nice turnout um, for this call and it's lovely to have Now What be able to support that or, or tap, in, tap in a little bit to what's going on in this conversation. Um, if people are interested in, in some of the rest of what's happening with this global gathering, which is on the general theme of the art of being fully human in a time of crisis, a framing we came up with in May of last year. <laughs> this is the fourth time we've, we've gathered. Um, we didn't know that we would have this particular crisis, but uh, there are more calls through, uh, through this Thursday. And then if you do register and get on our mailing list, you'll receive this about the next edition, which will be happening sometime in the late September into mid-October, somewhere in that range for another uh, probably six week period. And um, maybe next time we'll, we'll get Naomi Klein on to, uh, to pair up <laughs> with you, Mark, and, and really let things sizzle. Uh, that, so um, thank you all so much for, uh, for, for um, joining us for this conversation, uh, this presentation, very productive. Thank you. And just before we go, Jeremy, do you wanna say anything? Um, only to echo the, the thanks to, to Mark and to everyone who participated. They were great questions and it was a very um, respectful audience. Uh, one never knows what's going to happen on these online uh, meetings, but uh, this is a great advertisement for the medium, I think. And uh, th thank you so much, Mark. And uh, we'll take you up on that uh, suggestion that you may be back in Saskatchewan in person in the not too distant future. Thank you very much. I would love that. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Take care.